And is it the gathering storm for Mo Farah, or will the sun be shining on his marathon career? Who knows? This man knows all about it. The world record holder, the winner here in 2012, Wilson Kipsack. Jeffrey Mutai, the man who beat Mo Farah in the New York Half Marathon just three weeks ago. A man who knows how to win here in London. Cabeda timed it perfectly last year. The Olympic bronze medalist from 2008 thinks he can win it this time again. The world champion, the Olympic champion, loves running here in London. He's not the quickest on paper, but he does know how to win big races. Another former London winner and the man who's run the quickest round this course, two hours 4.40, Emmanuel Mutai. Now let's listen to the welcome for Mo. So what does Mo have in store for us today? Well, we're going to find out over the next two hours and five minutes or so. And the field is just the best we've ever seen here. I've said all of those names. Add in there Mekinen, who's run 2-4. The lesser of Ethiopia, Stanley Biwad, who tried to win it here this year. Samuel Sigai recently ran really well. Silver medal at the World Half Marathon Championships. Running for Great Britain as well, Chris Thompson and Scott Overall looking to get under 210 perhaps today and others looking for Commonwealth and European places in the summer. Thirty-four years we have gathered in Greenwich to watch one of the world's great sporting spectacles. And this year Mo Farah has just added a little bit of spice. We're on our way in the men's race. We were hoping that, of course, we uh, won a fast race. Uh, that's what everybody's been talking about. Uh, one of the people who's been given the job to make it fast is that man there, the pacemaker. Never thought I'd say that. Haile Gebri Selassie, perhaps the world's greatest ever distance runner. Right at the front there, pace one. And he's, I don't know if this is good or bad, Brendan. He's run 4.36 for the first mile. And that's pretty quick indeed. Well, there's only ever, first man ever been faster than that once, that was 4.35, a second faster. But I asked Hailey, why are you doing the pacemaking? He said, well, I've broken 26 world records over the years, and I've had some great athletes help me to do that. He said, I'm past my best time, I'm 41 next week. And he said, I thought it was my turn to give them a little bit of a help. They've helped me, so my turn to help them. And the great Hailey Gebri Selassie pacemaker, that's a world first. But he's going to run 20k, he's going to run the halfway point, and now Mo Farah has decided not to go with that pace being set by Hailey. So Mo has wisely settled for a bit of a little bit of a slower opening. Mo's in the second group following another pacemaker, and he's aiming at about 62 and a half minutes at the halfway point. But that's sensible from Mo. But if you look at it as a race, the Mo Farah, the Olympic champion, our greatest ever distance runner, has decided to let the main field run away and do their thing whilst he's doing his own thing so scientific approach to it that's been his approach in the last few years practicing picking up the drinks we've just seen him do that fairly effectively and now what's ahead of him well Brent's articulate that really well you know there was a decision to be made and also a decision to be made for the other athletes and uh, Jaylan has uh, decided to run his great track rival has decided to run with Mo but the others have gone with the early pace but already the front group is split into two and I think we were all really interested to see whether the front group would go maybe a little slower and Mo would go a little faster make one big group but no the front group have really attacked it early they've actually gone off at world record pace for the first five kilometers with Haile Gebri Selassie leading that and I think this is wise from Mo Farah to come into your first marathon and say I'm just going to go with it whatever happens I, I don't think that was wise I think the plan is himself and uh, Alberto Salazar they want him to hit halfway as you said Bren in, in a good time I mean for goodness sake 62 15 62 20 is heading for sub 2 5 and he is gambling a little bit that these guys are going to chew each other up a little bit and if they don't, hats off to them. If they carry on and run 2-3, 2-4, then great. But Mo has to just be a little bit careful in these 
in the early stages and then um, see what happens. Well, there's some great talent in that group there. Some athletes who know their way around. Led by the great one, the greatest distance runner of all time, Haile Gebrey Selassie, who at the age of 41 has still got ambitions. He wants to run next couple of weeks, to run a marathon in two hours, eight minutes for a 40-year-old age best. He's collecting more world records, but there's the Kebede, the reigning champion, Kip Sang, the world record holder. And I hope the message going out to the spectators on route isn't that Mo's losing. I think the message that's going out to the fans is that Mo's running his own race. He's chosen to run a more conservative race. It's his first one, and it's not surprising. It's perfectly understandable. This is a loaded field, and the leading Great Britain runner, not surprisingly, Mo Farah. The athlete who beat him in the World Championships, Ibrahim Jalan of Ethiopia, running right next to him. They know each other well. They'll be happy to run against uh, next to each other. And the question is, is Mo going to judge it right? Is the leading group going to slow down? And more importantly, what's going to happen to Mo Farah beyond the 20-mile mark? We're pretty sure he'll be in great shape at approaching 20 miles, but has he got the physical makeup to translate from a great 10,000-meter runner to a great marathon runner? It's an interesting baptism, but it's a little bit of a baptism of fire. But obviously, we're watching Mo carefully. But if you're looking at the international significance of this event, all the leading runners, including Haile Gebri Selassie, dismissed Mo's chances. Haile said that the athlete in yellow right behind him, Kebeda of Ethiopia, last year's champion, was the one to beat. Well, Haile knows a little bit about marathon running. He's been a great guide for these marathon runners in Ethiopia over the years. Tiranish Dubava, who's still in contention in the women's le leading group, has said that Haile has been fantastic in the help he's given her. But Haile, the great one, now doing paying a little bit back to the sport that he's graced so magnificently over the years. There's Mo with uh, his great rival, Jaylan Ibrahim Jaylan. He's a real character, Jaylan. He's one of the few Ethiopians actually trains in Kenya now. He was based in Japan. Of course, he beat Mo Farah in the World Championships in Daegu over 10,000 metres and finished second to him last year. So he's decided, I know Mo, I'm sticking with Mo. Two of them in the first marathon, letting these experienced guys go out and fight it amongst themselves in these early miles. And goodness me, Brendan, they have really gone out hard. Well, they have gone really quick and highly Gebri Selassie for the first time as a pacemaker has done a, an exuberant job there. He's led them along almost course record pace and the crowds at Cutty Sark are seeing the great man who's graced this sport since he was world champion 20 years ago. 1993 was his first world title. We've been privileged to have him as an ambassador in this in this sport, moving up from 10,000 metres and eventually world record holder at the marathon. Probably seeing him for the last time in a major competition, but we won't be going all the way today. He's trying to get to the halfway point, doing, providing a service to these other athletes who he helps and respects, including his Ethiopian teammates. But there they are, look at the crowds there, and in a moment, they'll get really excited when they see their favourite, the man they came to watch, Mo Farah, coming into Cutty Sark. There's the third group, and that includes Chris Thompson and Scott Overall. Chris Thompson and Scott Overall, two British athletes who are looking for good times and good performances. And in between those, Scott Overall running well there in the orange vest. In between this group and the group we saw, we're looking for Mo Farah, and we're listening, going to be listening to the crowd, but the crowd are getting warmed up as they step into th this area. And in that group, and you can sense by the way the crowd are reacting, Mo Farah right in the middle of that group. That's the second group, allowing the athletes up front, running at course record pace. Mo running just slightly slower than course record pace. But don't get too excited, Mo. Just relax, keep going. From halfway is when you need to make your decisions. But there's Mo Farah and Abraham Jalan in the orange vest, the Ethiopian world champion, leading the Great Britain effort, and the crowd are responding. They're coming out to watch Mo, and no, he's not losing, he's just running in the second group. There's a couple of people between Mo's group and the leading group, Brown, including the Olympic champion Stephen Kipletic, who knows what it's like to run with these big crowds, of course. It was a different route, lapped course during the Olympics. Kipletic went on to 
win the World Championship Marathon last year, so he's gone off at a quicker pace than he would normally do. He doesn't have fast races to his name. He's got gold medals. And I think that's an interesting dilemma for Mo Farah because if you are going to run the marathon in the Olympics, you don't have to necessarily be able to run 2-3. And Stephen Kipritic can't, hasn't yet. He actually hasn't run anywhere near as quick as most of these men. But he has the last two gold medals at the major championships. So it's not just about can you turn up to London, Chicago, or Berlin and run a quick time. It's about understanding the event, when to make the move, when not to make the move, when there are no pacemakers. And Kipritich has shown he's very, very good at that. Today he's about 30 seconds behind this lead group here, Brent. But as I said, there's more to it than just can you run fast. There certainly is. Highly managed to win the Olympic Games at 10,000 metres and then slowly moved up to the marathon and really did it right and managed to win and break the world record. But he really wanted to be Olympic champion at marathon. You know, that was the driving force. That is a big driver for these Ethiopian athletes because of their great history with Aviva Akila 50 years ago when the Tokyo Marathon and set the, the running thing happening in Africa. He was the first black African to win a gold medal. Aviva Akila. And highly given as he still talks about other athletes, but when he talks about Aviva Akila, he talks about him with a real reverence. One of Haile's regrets, you know, is that he never won the London Marathon. He's Everywhere else he's gone, he's managed to eventually win big races, including the world record in Berlin. But he was never able to win the London Marathon. And he says that in springtime in London, the pollen levels and the blossoms on the trees affected him a little bit. He didn't really enjoy it as much as he wanted to. But he was desperate to run the Olympic Games, and he wasn't selected by the Ethiopian team. In fact, the Olympic Games for Ethiopia uh, Marathon was a very disappointing thing for their men. They, they didn't finish at all well. Kebedi, he was another favourite, previous Olympic medalist in the yellow vest there. He didn't run the Olympic Games because he wasn't selected. So, well, news from the men's elite is that there's a big gap developing between this group and Mo Farah. I can tell you through 10 kilometres, which was just around the Kuti Sark thereabouts, that Mo was a good 45 seconds behind. So he's losing about 15 seconds every five kilometer section so could well be well over a minute behind or at least a minute behind at halfway there he is getting plenty of support Paula but Mo is just running a little slower than he'd asked for and uh, look he's saying to Jaylan come on come with me here because he's going to need a little bit of company Let's just watch this as uh, we try and find exactly how far he is behind the leaders. But it's a worrying gap at this point if he really wants to think about coming in the top three here. It absolutely is. And I would have been happier seeing him in this group just up ahead here that we're moving up to, um, which should be including uh, Stephen Kipritich, who is pretty uh, well experienced, we can say that, at the marathon and used to letting people go. And that's not even his biggest next group ahead that um, we needed to really see Mo in. I think what we've seen is the, the danger of having the two pace groups asked to go through halfway just 30 seconds apart. And where do they split up? Because that really isn't that much difference per mile pace. So in the beginning miles, I think it was pretty difficult to, to judge. And, what we've also maybe seen a little bit as one of the pacemakers steps off way too early there, not Haile Gebrselassie, but I think we have seen a little bit of inexperience for Haile as a pacemaker. And I think to li sitting in the press conference, listening to it, so many people were saying that they really benefit would benefit from the fact that he's in the race. The likes of Kibeda saying to stand on the same start line as, as him and to have him helping was a big thing. But he's used to racing. He's used to running how you feel. He's not used to hitting pace splits, and I know he was very, very worried. I think Mo Farrell was maybe listening to us and to the crowd because he's definitely picked up his pace. He's moved away from Jaylan. He wanted Jaylan to come with him. I think he realized he maybe was going a little bit too slow. He was just outside 30 minutes through the first 10 kilometers, and that's the Olympic champion. And uh, Sigai, the man who picked up um, a medal at the uh, recent World Half Marathon, championships which are held in Copenhagen and look at Mo he's saying come on guys work with me here he's looking for some company he's not he hasn't got it from Jaylan he knows he's quite a long way adrift there's the 15 kilometer times 4406 for the lead group and at 10k Mo was 45 seconds adrift and he wouldn't want that gap to get much bigger what they may slow down at the front the likelihood is that it won't but Mo to me looks as though he's really getting into this that first 10k took his time and then he obviously realized, well, I need to move into a slightly different rhythm here. Well, he's running very smoothly. He's running comfortably here. And the interesting thing 
he's never been in a race like this before when you look at it he's actually there and the race is happening down the road all his whole career Mo Farah has been in races where he's always been in sight of the, of, the, of the leaders here he's out of sight he's running his own race he's gauging his effort we saw him stuttering into the table there to pick up his drink we didn't quite it's not quite the smoothest thing but it's a new experience for Mo and you look at the, look at these uh, athletes and you look at the, the world record holders there the last year's champions there the New York winners there they're, they're all there and Mo Farah was practicing, you know, over the last few weeks. And Paula was helping him to get his drinks. Yeah. And there he is, moving to the side of the road, getting ready, sees the table, and then slows down, looking around, grabs his drink. And see how important it is. It really is important, Paula. Did you teach him that bit? No, well, it's actually very interesting because there was a big discussion going on about whether Mo was going to pick up his own drink off the table or take it from someone. Um, and that isn't as simple a decision as it sounds because you, well, if you're going to take it from someone, you think it might be easier, but it can actually be harder depending on whether they hold it in the correct way. So at the last minute, he switched because yesterday he was definitely going to have someone hand them to him. And he has been practicing in Kenya and it looked actually a lot smoother in training, but that's, of course, going to be the case because the nerves coming into it, you're worried about whether you get your drink or not, and it means a lot race day. Right, folks, um, if you're a bit worried about Mo setting off, and we said that first 10K, we'll have just uh, been doing some sums, and Mark Butler's just confirmed it. Thank goodness, our statistician. Mo ran the last 5K as quick as the leaders. So he's picked up his pace. They've settled a little bit, but he is still 45 seconds behind. And I think that's OK. I don't think you would have wanted that gap to have got any bigger if he's got any real intention to be involved in the latter stages with, with some of these guys. But... Mo Farah now running at the same pace as the leaders, but he's obviously perhaps expended less energy in the early stages. Uh, remember there was two, a couple of very quick miles at the very beginning. So he's warming to the task, shall we say, but there's a lot of talent in that group, as Brendan was saying, and they all look pretty comfortable at this point. Good pace being set at the front of the men. I'm looking for the greatest of all time, highly. The pacemaker, well, he's not there yet. He said he wouldn't get much past halfway, but according to that shot, he didn't get to halfway. Well, and they're not really running, well, they're on about course record pace, so just under 2.5 perhaps, but they were going a bit quicker now. They're on about 2.4, 35, 40. That is 2.4, 40 is the course record. And I, I did think highly when the last time we saw him looked as though he was a bit warmer, shall we say, than the others. Now, the good news is, though, that not far behind, Mo Farah has really made inroads. Now, whether she is working too hard in this part of the race, but he's made big inroads into the lead that that lead group had. They've been running about 451, 452, 453, and that's given him the chance to get back in this race here. And Mo won't be too far away from his target time at halfway. It's going to be a little bit slower than he had intended, but he's not going to be too far away. You know, he'd be so excited with the crowds and the reception he's getting here on Tower Bridge. I mean, they're really cheering for him, they're really making a noise. And you know, Mo in his personality is an excitable person, and he, he doesn't want to get too excited, but he does know that that crowd and that cheer are right behind him. He's here in Britain, he's asking the other athlete to come alongside him, give him a bit of a hand, but at the end of the day, they're just a little bit too far away from the pacemakers. And that alongside him is Sege of Eritrea, and he's just happy to follow Mo Farah. He thinks the cheers are for him, and that's, that's great. But look at it, isn't it, isn't it magnificent? Isn't that a magnificent sight? And there's our greatest ever distance runner, running a very, very good race. A lot more to come here today from Mo Farah, and we're all waiting with nervous anticipation. The great ones are up the front, the, the marathon experts are at the front, and here's Mo, a debutant of the marathon, moving on through. Can this great track runner become a great marathon runner? We'll get a few clues today, but we won't get all the clues. And he's working hard now. He's asking Sergei to come round and share some of that work with him. I'm not quite sure why the two pacemakers are running that far up the road ahead of him. They should be um, just ahead of him, and he should be able to, to work with them uh, and use their pacemaking services, I guess. And now he essentially is the pacemaker, and Sergei is quite happy to sit behind him and not prepared to do any of the work. No, they're trying to, to motion to the guys in front of him just to drop back a little bit and run with him. But well, does he think they've got eyes in the back of their head? <laughs> yeah, he needs to shout. Uh, 
just to reiterate what I said, he's just past 20 k, he's approaching halfway in a few hundred meters, but he ran five seconds quicker for that 10, 5k section than the leaders did. But of course, that's hard as well. He's having to pick up the pace in the middle of the race here just to try and get back in contact. And I think there are some men in that lead group who are probably having an easy time of it. They're going slower perhaps than was maybe initially suggested. They must be just about at a halfway point. As the shard comes into view there, that's 20k. Don't forget, halfway is 21.1 kilometers. So Kipsang is in there, Kabeda's in there, Manuel Mutai, Mekanen is in there, Jeffrey Mutai, Stanley B. Watt, Lalesa, and Absheru. It's men who've run under 2.5, men who've run under 2.4, the world record holder. And the man who's run the fastest ever marathon, of course, Jeffrey Mutai, on the Boston course, which isn't applicable for the world record, but he still ran quick there. So, Big group, plenty of talent, Mo Farah chasing them. Big, big crowds, of course, you get two bites of the cherry here, you get to see them on the way out towards Canary Wharf, and then you get to see them on the way back. So, just to let you know, his target time was 62.15 at the halfway point. So he's obviously well down on that, but I think the leaders were slower than they'd intended to be as well. And Mo is struggling now to get onto the pacemakers. He's struggling to get his message to the pacemakers. I think he was um, trying to ask the, the camera bike then if he could go ahead and ask the two guys to slow down. There he is through the halfway point, 63.07 or something it looked like. Um, which, in honesty, if Mo Farah was trying to, to plan the way to attack a first marathon, go through in 63, it'd be pretty much perfect. So the only factor is that he is now on his own does a lot of his training on his own too and he is quite used to uh, unable to do that it just would be easier for him if he could certainly use these two guys in front who are actually being paid to do that job and need to look around and assess uh, what's happening behind them and, and get some information as well and, and drop back and run with Mo and certainly maybe to uh, Sergei if he wants to go with them too. But isn't that a problem Bren you know the, the trouble is these guys get told what they're supposed to do they they you know, they get paid, let's, everybody knows, pacemakers get paid, and they get told, you have to go through in 62.15. So for them, it's a dilemma. They, they're only doing what they've been asked to do, but they should use a little bit of common sense, you would think, to say, well, OK, he's not, he's not quite at that pace, let's drop back and try and take him through. But I think, Bren, he's only now about 40 seconds, 35 to 40 seconds behind this lead group, and he'll start to see them. You know, when you go through these twists and turns through Canary Wharf, and that's a big thing as well. You start thinking, well, hang on, they're not that far away. You'll probably be worried that there's so many of them in this group. But uh, nonetheless, it's, things are looking a little bit better for them than they were four or five miles ago. And they'll start peeling off that group, Steve. But they won't all peel off, that's the thing. Mo's going to have to run faster. And if you think about the first half, he's run 63 minutes for the first half, which is great, which is on schedule for a British record, which is, let's face it, that's what he said he wanted to do. But the thing is, he's had to run a little bit hard in the second half of that opening half because of the early pace. He's had to run a bit hard to get there in that scheduled time. So let's hope he doesn't pay too much, pay too much for that because this group has got some really tough marathon runners in it. Let's just have a little look at uh, an incident earlier. We've uh, just been managed to turn this around. This was Mo uh, just before. We have just saw him recently. Another drink station. Now watch. Grab it? No. Missed it. Now, Tunes de Barba went back and got it. Mo didn't. Paula, what would you have done? Well, he couldn't go back and get it because it fell down fell the down. other side of the, of the red advertising hoarding or, or whatever it is there. So he actually wasn't able to do that. And that may have been, when we were saying he was gesturing to ask the camera bike to go and ask the two guys to slow down, I think he was asking for his, them to bring his bottle to him, Can't which they're not allowed to no. do. Um, did happen to me once. And the thing now is not to panic. It's one bottle. You've got eight bottles on the course, so you, he's, he's had the other seven. He can pick up the... Um, carbohydrate supplement which will be available on the course which I think is Gatorade. There's Tanya, Mo Farah's wife sitting there watching. Not much information for her on the big screen but interestingly Mo Farah working hard now settling down having missed the drink. It's getting very technical here with pacemakers, drink stations, catching drinks, picking up drinks. The big story is Mo Farah is about between a half a minute and 40 seconds behind that leading group. The leading group's got some real stars amongst it. 
their pacemaker is doing a good job and they're really working to keep them together to keep this pace together and as I'm looking at Mo Farah we're getting information that the world record holder Wilson Kipsang is now moving towards the lead there's Mo trying to get another drink he, did, he, he missed his own drink he missed his own specific drink he was trying to get just a bottle of water there from the crowd there because he obviously needs it and as they keep going it's getting a bit warmer and the real testing time of the marathon is now is coming up fairly soon not quite just yet but there's a lot of running to do but Mo Farah is still in the race as the race changes its tempo Kip Sang the world record holder hits the front ignores the pacemaker goes dashing past him and then starts to really work them now this is going to be interesting the groups will start to get smaller one or two of them will fall off because they make too much effort so now the world record holder for the marathon comes along and really shows it can he try and win this one from a very long way out Wilson Kipsang who broke the world record in Berlin last year now declaring his intention there's too many in the group for my liking I don't want to be in amongst them I want to have some space on the road and I remember he did this in the Olympics he was leading in the Olympics in London by by 25 seconds. Well, he went off really hard in the first half in, in London, though, didn't he, Brendan? He really did pay for it. This has been a, I think it's his very steady pace for these guys, and they they've been waiting and waiting for somebody to make the move. I thought Cabela looked very comfortable. He's just tucked in there. Certainly, Jeffrey Mutai looks comfortable, and Kip Sang, though, he's the man who that I think I do think they all look to him. I do think he's the one who garners most respect at the moment. And Kip Sang deciding that, OK, guys, you want to come with me? I am the fastest man in the world. I am the world record holder. He's reputed to be in great shape, having come into this race. He likes running here in London, he says. But that is a pack of really, really good, strong runners. And off this sort of pace, they, they should all, well, most of them are going to be, they won't all be feeling great, one or two just going off. But Biwat is there, Kabeda is there, Mutai, uh, Jeffrey Mutai is there, and uh, Mekkonen, the man who says he's 18, uh, I think most of us have uh, doubts about that, the man who ran a world junior record is still there. I'm just looking to see if Jeff, uh, Emmanuel Mutai is just, is he still at the back of that group there? I think he is. Mary Wharf, they've just come through the first of the tunnels and come back out into the daylight and they've just settled down again after that little bit of a nibble at the front from the world record holder Wilson Kipsang they've all just settled again every time they do that that's good news for Mo Farah here he is Mo just emerging from that tunnel Mo at the moment time wise on schedule for a British record let's not forget he said that was his minimum target two hours seven thirteen seconds Steve Jones in 19. Well, how many years ago is it now? It's, I've got to do my maths. It's 1985. Yeah, I was just trying to say. So it's what year 19. Is it? 2014. Yeah, exactly. 29 years. Well, Mo, 18 and a half. Though, okay, it was Chicago, thanks. wasn't it? October. It was October, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So Mo Farah certainly well under that. He may have the European record as well within sight. I think he's uh, round about the 2.6.20 mark for the European record. Two hours, six minutes and 36 seconds. It's going to be a long, hard run now, Brendan, though, because I think that lead group are going to pick up a little bit. I think they are going to make some moves. There may be one or two come back to him. But it's a big gap between him and the rest of that group now. He really needs something to work with, doesn't he? But he really wanted just a, a very good race today. And at the moment, he's having a very good race. He, he said he could run well today and not be in contention, but still be satisfied. He wants to run a good time. Well, he's on schedule for a good time. He's on schedule for a British record. But he's looking at some of the tough men here. Kabede is a very strong athlete. He runs really powerfully in the second half of the race. I mean, this time last year, he was chasing the leader. He caught him, Mutai. He caught him at Big Ben and, and went, went away and won it. So he's, he's used to having a... A, a different and a difficult mid-race but from the halfway point they're now getting serious this is a competitive race and it's very unlikely that enough of them are going to drop off or Mo's going to be able to speed up to affect the result here of the one two three but let's hope and wait 
information-wise up and down the course, I think the maybe one sort of significant thing is these guys aren't necessarily going to get a whole lot of information about how much Mo is closing on them and how much closer he's getting. He is going to be getting the information because people in the crowd will be out there, will be clocking that um, time difference between the leaders and him and handing that to him. And that, if it's coming down, will help him significantly mentally. Well, it was coming down. I think it might be going slightly in the other direction now. Uh, they've just run a 4.30 mile, which is one of the quickest miles, almost 20 seconds faster than they have been running more recently. So that's an indication that things are starting to really get moving at the front. And Mo is going to have to stick to his game plan and try and stick to what he was uh, planning to do. And meanwhile, as far as the other British men are concerned, Chris Thompson in the blue, Scott Overall in the orange there, running very, very well indeed. Went through halfway and just outside 65 minutes. And that's uh, setting them up very, very nicely indeed for a hopefully a good second half. Chris running his first marathon, like Mo Farah, the two of them grew up competing against each other in their early age group years. Scott Overall ran so well in Berlin, Berlin three years ago when he ran two hours 10 52 looking to break that personal best and he's on course for that at the moment you can hear the message being passed on in the course most coming most coming and he is he certainly is coming he certainly is running well to me he's looking pretty smooth and there's a last mile time just come up there five minutes well presumably that that's the leading group or I think that can be correct. From a 4.30 to a 5 minute would be a bit of a jump. But it's certainly the 14th and 15th miles can be run very fast on this course and you come off the bridge and you can get some good speed up. So that might account for the 4.30, but I'm not sure they would have slowed down that much unless they really are bunching around looking at each other. Well, I'll tell you what, I honestly haven't seen crowds like this before at this stage of the race. Sometimes there's a lonely park down there, but here they are coming up to the 16 mile point Mo Farah will be looking, just following the pacemaker, running in the middle of the road, getting the support from the crowds, thinking about how he's going to approach the really difficult stage of the race. Plenty running yet left for Mo Farah, but to me, it looks as though he's going to run a very, very good race. Well, I'm not sure that race is going to be good enough to trouble these athletes. Well, it might be a, a battle, but it's one that I'm not sure has really been joined yet, as it were, in the sense that... 4.53 for that mile there's just too much talent in here they are running so close to the record pace that was required uh, to break 2.5 and get close to 2.440 which belongs of course to Manuel Mutai and Mo Farah will get a real indication of uh, how far back he is at least he's got the pacemaker to work with now and of course the crowds giving Mo such great support 17 miles and you're not even at the part where people say this race really begins at 18, 19 miles. That's Richard Whitehead just ahead of him. One of our Paralympic heroes from 2012. Uh, Richard, uh, they said he was suffering from a bit of a cold coming into this, but enjoying the atmosphere. Well, the men's race really is starting to get moving now. Cabeda, the latest to start to push. It's not about the pacemakers anymore. It's about the men who think they can win this. And Emmanuel Mutai, the first to struggle at the back of this group. Jeffrey Mutai is right there, the two of them not related. Stanley Biwat, who was impetuous last year, impatient. Beckenden on the far side there. And Abshero, the other very talented Ethiopian in that group. The lesser just starting to work hard at the back. And the world record holder nearest the curb on the far side. That's Wilson Kipsang. Jeffrey Mutai just looking for a little bit of room. Now... Mo Farah, we think is about 50 seconds or so, and I think he's working hard now. We had a period where the pace was steady, nobody really pushing on from that lead group. There you can see, that's how they stood at 30k. Kabeda was there, Mekinen was there, Jeffrey Mutai was there, Biwat was there, Kipsan, Abshero, Lalesa. Emmanuel Mutai was just at that point beginning to fall off, and Mo Farah, a minute behind, they're on course record pace. Mo Farah still on British record pace. Don't forget that British record. Two hours, seven minutes and 13 seconds. And this is how it looks. Kipsang 
while we were watching the women's finish put in a big surge and it's completely pulled that lead group apart and Stanley B. Watt is now the only man with him. Jeffrey Mutai is giving chase in third place. Kabeda is the one that surprised me that hasn't been able to go with this but it could well be that given the fact that it's been slow I don't think this is rash, I don't think this is two athletes who've over, overcooked this, who've made a bad decision. These are the two men who perhaps have the race between them. Yeah, I think Kip Sang is the man who, who came in here certainly talking the bigger race and acting as though he was the one who was coming here to, to run fast. He said he was going to run at least 2-4 uh, and he was going to control this race. And now he, he's injected his pace and it is only Stanley Biwak who's been able to go with him. And he doesn't look as though he's really, really pushing hard. I think he's just moved it up a gear and is controlling it at that now. This was similar to last year. Stanley Biwak was in contention at this point. And now it's a case of last year, I think he pushed it a little bit hard, and Mo is relishing the crowd. About a minute behind that leading group, so it's a pretty significant step in the right direction by Mo Farah. But you know, it's been a strange experience for him. When he runs on the track, he can control the races these days. He's got such a reputation and such an ability. This race is a, is a, a new step. You can't I can tell you that Mo is um, slowing slightly to the point where his pace is slipping towards that British record. He just needs to be strong in the last few miles if he's to be rewarded with that time. But that's an athlete working hard there. That's uh, finding out what the marathon is all about. He's doing well. He's doing very well. First race. First taste of what this is all about but he needs to hold it together. In these last 25 minutes or so, the crowd are going to be very important to help him on his way. Yeah, the crowd are going to be very important and the, the training and the backlog that he's put in and he needs to, to almost go back into that a little bit now. You can see the, the strain and the grimaces starting to show on his face. He needs not to panic. He needs to think back to the long runs that he's done out in Kenya and the hard work that he's put in there and almost feel like he, he's back there again working with that and not thinking about the fact that he has so far to go to the finish and what he needs to be doing. He doesn't need to be thinking about times, just, just one foot in front of the other at this point and just we're doing that as efficiently and as well as possible. But if you look at him, you know, it was, a, it was a decision that he made himself. He wanted to run the marathon. He started the London Marathon. He's the epitome of the London Marathon for the organisers. He started with a mini marathon. He won that when he was a kid a couple of times. He's moved on through to great Olympic glory and now he's trying to run the marathon for the very reason that the London Marathon is the one to run. It is the greatest marathon in the world. And if you're going to be, and if you're a British athlete, this is where you want to be. But most choice when his speed at the lower distances, breaking Steve's British record at 1,500 metres and world champion at five and 10,000 metres, you know, he didn't have to move to the marathon. He doesn't have to move to the marathon. He's learned a lot about himself today. And I wonder if he's in a position here where the race has happened without him interfering with it at all. And I wonder if he can safely start to step up the distances and decide the marathon is an event for me. He is slowing, he is tiring. His great athletic strength is his mental strength and his speed at the finish. In the middle of this race, his speed isn't of any advantage, and his mental approach certainly is an advantage, but he's working hard for this one. He's working very hard. Meanwhile, side by side, stride for stride, and be what not taking in a drink is that a wise decision you can see he's thought okay just while you grab that drink I'll keep pushing a little bit friend mentioned last year impetuous at this stage of the race Stanley B. Watt when he might have uh, been a bit smarter and he tried to push on and then in fact he was leading with what three miles to go I think or three and a half miles to go and I think he finished eight uh, completely blew up I hope for his sake that experience is one that he's learned from looked as though it is you know, these two are looking comfortable to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm surprised they're on their own. Yeah, I'm a bit surprised they're on their own as well. I expected it to be a bigger group. I don't think they've done any significant um, changes in pace that should have broken up the pack quite as much as it has done, but maybe it's on the back of the very fast start as well, which might have done a bit more damage 
than we thought. But be what, yeah, I'm surprised he didn't take a drink because the, what happened to him last year was probably a classic just running out of fuel. And so you'd want to be doing everything that you can to make sure that you've got some carbohydrate and got some energy still there as you get into those last five, six kilometers. That's a cup from we've seen lots of times before. Kenya, one, two, and three. Ethiopia, four, five, and six at the big city marathons. It's not always the case in the major championships. The Kenyans can often run too many big races and run too fast in between. And then the championships, often the Ethiopians prevail. But there we are, two very good athletes, including the world record holder, Wilson Kipsang. Previously, he's won this race. He wants to win it again. In my view, he could have been Olympic champion if he just gauged that race properly. He has been the outstanding marathon runner in the last few years. Just whispering a few words to Stanley B. What is less experienced, compatriot, less, less ab able compatriot. And you know, when they were talking in press conferences in the week, I think they loved the fact that Mo Farah was coming. He's coming on our territory. We're marathon runners. We know what we're doing. And there's this young upstart. We know he's pretty good on the track, but he's not going to bother us in the marathon. And they almost said those words, and he hasn't bothered them, has he? No, I think they were looking forward to just getting out here and racing. I mean, don't forget that Mo Farah has gone and trained in their backyard. And so I'm sure there's been a lot of keeping an eye on exactly what he's doing, a lot of rumors flying around. But as we've all said, you don't know exactly until you actually come out on marathon day and you race. And some of those questions get answered. So I think Kip Sang will definitely have gained in confidence from A, not seeing Mo go with the first group in the beginning and then not seeing him figure uh, and get back to them now. But now he's forgotten about that. He's just focusing on trying to win the race and see what, what pace he can run, what, speed, what time he can run. Mo taking his drink with him. That's a smart thing to do. Get as much of it as he can, pointless throwing it away, it's going to need it in these last few miles, getting loads of support, but he is slowing. That British record will keep reminding you, 2 hours 7 and 13 seconds, and he's going to have to work hard now if he is to break that record. We talked about the top two behind them. Brett was on about the Ethiopian challenge. There's Mekkanen, the world junior record holder for the marathon. Just one race. It was a very, very good debut. As I said, some question marks. He was asked if he was 18 at the press conference the other day. He said yes. There was a little bit of mirth went around the room, but that's what it says on his passport. And then a little further up. Well, these groups are really important in terms of what happens now because for the likes of um, Jeffrey here who really has slowed down rather significantly it's going to be a bit of a struggle now because he was in third spot not so long ago he was ahead of Cabeda and uh, I think we saw from that shot that they'll be the next two athletes we can see the lesser working with Cabeda the two of them moving ahead of Jeffrey Mutai the man who beat Mo Farah in the New York half marathon. There they are, and they're moving well away, aren't they? So Cabeda and Lalesa moving, or working well together. And so they've now moved into the battle for third spot, but I don't think, in fact, I'm absolutely sure they're not going to um, try to have Shero with, uh, with him. I'm absolutely sure that They've got no chance of catching the front two. Cabela just uh, saying, Abshero, come on, let's keep working here. Hey, Cabela is still, they're, they're still running 2 5 pace, these guys. The leaders are still on sub 2 5, still on course record pace. Well, we just got some information from Mark Butler, our statistician, who keeps busy getting the time from the lead bikes, and he's just told me that Mo Farah has just out slipped outside British record pace. Two, Two hours, seven minutes, and 24 seconds. So he is finding it tough. But I'm so impressed with the crowds. Such a beautiful spring day. Almost heralds the start of spring, this London Marathon. Once again, this beautifully organized, the best marathon in the world. And the organizing team, led by Nick Vittell and Dave Bedford and Hugh Brasher, must be thrilled at the public response to this wonderful event. And we're seeing a race here. Stanley Biwak, Wilson Kipsang, the world record holder, comes to London 
wants to win it again. Can he win it again? Stanley Biwot, who's promised a lot and is expected to feature, is he going to prevail? But the two of them, just as in the women's race, two women look together right till the very last stage. Is it going to be the same here? And Mo Farah's run, you know, he hasn't troubled the leaders. He has created a tremendous impact. And there he is. And look at the support he's getting. And look at the support the crowds are giving him. And right now, I think Mo needs it. And if we, when he analyzes his race, we'll find that the second 5,000 meters went up to 10K. When he closed that gap, he was working hard there, running a bit too quick. And maybe he's paid for that. But here's a race which, this must be a strange experience for Mo. The Olympic champion, the world champion, so now successful on the track. 1,500 meters breaks the British record. No British athlete has ever held the records for 1,500 meters, 5 and 10, and the marathon. Others have held the records 1,500, 5 and 10, but nobody's been able to do it at the marathon. And can he do it? Well, in the future, maybe he can, but should he? Or should he concentrate on his track running? Well, I think he has been quite open about his decision will be made after this race. It's going to be a tough one, though, isn't it? You know, uh, we sit here and we've, all of us in the world of marathon running have wondered what would happen. It, uh, I might mention, Brent, I know you like the bookies. He was evens to be seventh or worse. So uh, they always know what they're talking about, don't they? So <laughs> Mo still maybe got a chance to get in the top seven. Come on, Mo. And, of course, that British record. I think Paul has, right? I think Steve Jones might maybe had a little flutter that he might keep well, it. I don't know. But um, Steve Jones in the press conference yeah. the other day said it is tough, you know. 2-7 is hard to do. And Mo's, if, if he is going to do it, he's slipping outside it now. He's, he's finding that out. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good point. Steve Jones is the tough man of the marathon. I mean, when he set that British record, he went through in 61.43. So he knows something about who might or might not come and run fast. But if you said Steve got his decision, and now we're watching Mo Farah, and to be honest, you know, we, talk, we talked about him, um, about a decision he was going to make. Well, the interesting thing is his decision about his future at the marathon will be made in the next couple of miles. Because if he's going to run out, if he doesn't hit the British record and, and he's hurt in the middle and his times fade away around the 23, 24 mile point, then I think the decision for Mo Farah is pretty easy. I think Mo Farah, the greatest distance runner we've ever had on the track, I think Mo Farah goes back to the track, sticks on the track, runs the 1500 meters and the 5000 meters. And a long time since Mo Farah ran a race, and I'm thinking it's maybe five years ago since Mo Farah ran a race where he wasn't in control of the race. Today, you can't say anything other. He hasn't been in control of this one. He's suffering now. He's working hard. And the one thing you get from Mo Farah, you get honest endeavor. He's always been a grafter. And he says those words. I've always grafted in my training. I've always grafted in races. He's certainly grafting today, but I think Mo's decision about the marathon well, I know what I would do, I'd stick to the track. Well, I think in all honesty, what he wanted to do was try the marathon, see what he could do at it, but in his mind, he was thinking about going back to the track in Rio, and I think that might be reinforced now. In fairness, his last few weeks have probably not been ideal uh, coming into this. He was training really well, but then with what happened in New York and with possible calf injuries, meaning that he just missed a little bit of training, that will have affected it. But I think he is getting answers as to whether he likes the marathon and to whether it suits him. And you know, Brent, I, I think as well, when you come into it, you, you have to have a game plan. And his game plan was, I run in the second group. Well, the truth is, the guys in the first group were running the pace that he thought he was, should be running, 62-15. And of course, if you decide to run in the second group, and he obviously realized at, at, a, at a point after about 10K that that, wasn't, that plan wasn't coming together in the way that he thought. But he, he had no option. You can't go herring off in your first marathon. You have to have a plan to work to. And... I don't know whether that would affect his thinking going forward. I suspect that if he runs, I, I agree with you, I think two, seven and a half or something, that's good, that's very, very good. It wouldn't be the British record, but I think where Mo Farah is in his career, I'm not sure that would be good enough to make him change his mind about moving away from the track. We'll come back to that very briefly, just friend, because this is really warming up now, and uh, we've just seen Cabetta uh, pushing ahead of Archero for third spot, but these two are locked together there's not far to go now. They've just run a 4.38 mile. Course record definitely on the cards. Somewhere around about two minutes, two hours, four minutes and 30 seconds, Brent. But two men here, either of whom could win this. Is the world record holder, Wilson Kipsan, going to win the London Marathon again. 
or is Stanley Beaver really going to step into an area he's never been before? He won Paris a couple of years ago, but that isn't the same level as this. But these two now, they're racing it out. And we said earlier about Mo Farah that he, that he hasn't troubled this, this race. He hasn't troubled these athletes. He's hurting a lot down the road. He's finding out an awful lot about himself. But as he struggles along the embankment, these guys are getting faster and faster. And I personally have enjoyed the Mo Farah coming to run the marathon. But so have these guys. They like to have the big hitter come into the race just to show them it's a different distance. We're the bosses. You come and try it. And guess what? You can't beat us. And it will have fired them up too as well. And we saw last year that a lot of the Kenyans, Kip Sang included, came here and didn't maybe run as well as we expected to do. But they had had a very, very wet season back in Kenya and weren't able to prepare as well as normal. This year, it's been good conditions and they have prepared well. And I think Kip Sang has come here saying he wanted to run 2-4 and right and tried to run 2-4. Well, you know, Wilson Kipsang, as Mo Farah Mode has been chatting with Wilson quite a bit out in E10 where, the, where he's been training. There's Emmanuel Mutai, and I think if you said to Mo, you can beat Emmanuel Mutai, he would have certainly taken that one. And they've fallen off that group, but not enough that he's had something to attack. It might just help him pick up over the last couple of miles, and that record might come a little bit closer to him again if he's got something to work with. Let's go back to... Um, Wilson Kipsang, you can see there through 40k. He's become a big star in uh, E10. Mo Farah certainly is. Kipsang's got his own hotel, a training camp, and uh, much like Lorna Kiplagat did, which uh, British athletes very much use, including Mo these days. But Mo just picking up again here. And Mutai, as you'd expect, thinks, hang on, that's Mo Farah. I'm not just going to let him go past. So Mutai just picked up a little bit. Mutai probably glad to, to slot in behind there. But also this is territory for Mo that he has run before. We talk about the marathon being unknown, but he's run this many times as the mini marathon. And now as he gets into this, he does actually, it might be a while back, but he remembers that and he knows that these are the streets of London. And as he gets close to that finish, he is going to get more of a spring in his step and certainly pull a lot of energy from this crowd here today. And there's the man taking an awful lot more energy from the crowd. Wilson Kipsang just relaxing and stretching, coming up to the two-hour point, and they'll be turning past Big Ben in a few moments, and Wilson Kipsang, the world record holder, approaching Big Ben at midday on a beautiful April morning, beginning of springtime, really, almost the beginning of summertime here in London, as this man who came here with one intention, and that was to show that the world record that he set in Berlin last autumn, his form had continued, he's in the best form of his life, and he's able to beat a very strong field. And now the next question is, can he beat the course record? And I'm sure he's got that on his mind, and there'll be a target for him to do that as the, the leading athletes now come along there. Big Ben at 12, two hours in the marathon. And Wilson Kipsang looking good looking comfortable in a position he's been in before he's won this race before the only little blip was I think this man was good enough a couple of years ago to become the Olympic champion of the marathon and he misjudged that race he ran a little bit too fast in the middle he knows the streets of London from the marathon he knows the streets of London were less <coughs> able to give him that Olympic gold medal which I think he was the best athlete in the world at that time but here he is now, showing it once again. A world record holder, a long birdcage walk, and these crowds are staggering. That is a very significant gap that's opened up very, very quickly. So um, two things have happened. He's injected uh, a lot of pace quickly, and I think also Stanley B. Watt has, has fallen apart just a little bit for that to open up so fast like that. And now he is really focused on trying to break that course record, which I think is, is what he came here to do all along. And, spent some time in the middle of the race watching and just waiting in the pack and maybe they threw away the chance to, to run a world record out there today because I think very very good conditions there and we've seen people in very very good shape well only 10 men have ever run including himself of course under uh, two hours four minutes and 30 seconds and Kip Sang is heading for around that time and that would be a course record He's maybe going to be even a little bit quicker than that. So Kipsang, with about a 10-second lead 
over Stanley Biwat and then about another 90 seconds behind are these two, Kabeda and Achero, two Ethiopians. The Kabeda last year, of course, he timed his move really well. Well, you could say he timed his move really well. He just kept going when the others all fell apart, to be honest. It was a slow winning time. And I think the view was here that Kabeda will run 2-5, and he may well run 2-5 or just outside. But will he be good enough if one of the really good guys, and we'll put Kip Sang in that category, if one of the really good guys, Kip Sang or Mutai, runs fast, would Kabeda be able to cope with it? I think the answer, we've seen that here, but what you get is consistency for this man. 17 marathons, Brent. He hardly ever has a bad one. And while we're looking at Kabeda, they're working for his third place. We're looking at the world record holder, Wilson Kipsang. We're looking at his teammate, Stanley Biwat. And then eventually we'll see Kabeda come into shot. But you know, there's been a lot of talk about this marathon and about Mo Farah. And when you look at it, why would you choose to take on these athletes of such strength and consistency? Why would you want to take them on at the marathon? When you've owned the 10,000 meters for the last few years, you're the best in the world at 10,000 meters. And I hope Mo Farah sees the sense here to let these guys stay with the marathon. He stay with the shorter distances, the 10,000 meters. He might run marathons again in the future, but I would like to have Mo Farah thinking about fairly quickly Rio in 2016, Mo, stick to the 10,000 meters, try and defend your titles, that's what you want, that's what we all want, this is too much of an unknown territory, and these athletes, they're like gunslingers, you know, they're so strong, and there's so many of them, and they're getting better, and they're able to be competitive in the late stages, and there's Stanley B. Watt running a real solid race, and here's Mo Farah, with the crowds supporting him, coming along, approaching, Big Ben and Emmanuel Mutai for company. Emmanuel Mutai is with Mo Farah because Emmanuel tried to win it. Mo tried to judge it. And what time is he going to run? Well, he's going to be just outside, we think, the British record. But it's still a really good performance. I'm pleased he did it. Well, he now has to keep going because the English record is held by Charlie Spedding, of course, winner of the London Marathon and Olympic bronze medalist. And we'll do more on Mo in a minute because in the finishing straight, Wilson Kipchan. The world record holder from Kenya, the man who won here in 2012, not in the Olympics, won the London Marathon, took a medal at the Olympics and has come back in fine style here. Top on all comers in the greatest field ever assembled in London. Wilson Kipsang is the champion. It's a new course record. Brilliant performance. Two hours, 4.27, the unofficial time. He is number one in the world. And nobody can doubt it. Everybody was here. Stanley Biwat ran a great race. Not one of the big names, but he has run two hours five before. And he's going to be very close to his personal best. Takes about 20 seconds off it. Well done, Stanley Biwat. He gets second spot. Learned his lesson from last year. And then we await the battle for third between Abshero and Kabeda. They'll be coming ah. into the mall. Woo very very soon to the world record holder Wilson Kipsang one of his greatest races he loves his course he says I like running in London despite what happened in the Olympics where he just overcooked it I think in the early stages but that is a great run from Kipsang and what a good job he had three passports because otherwise he wouldn't even have made it in would he because having had his passport stolen he wasn't able to, to get in until two days later than scheduled so he made it he set a course record and I think he could have challenged the world record today one more turn for the two Ethiopians Kabeda at the front the diminutive figure of uh, the man who won here last year not able to defend his title with a win but he's going to fight for this third spot his teammate Abshero a man himself who ran 2.423 in 2012 and Abshero sitting on his shoulder but Kabeda strong and he just kicks away again those little legs moving as quick as they can just finds a little bit extra and Sigai Kabeda will take third spot here and Abshero has run a great race and we'll have to settle the fourth 2629 and the next person the next people will be starting to look for will include Mo Farah 
just to go back to Kip Sang, you know, we talk about the Mo Farahs and even the Kibeda who sort of came to this a little bit late. You know, Kip Sang didn't start running properly until he was about 26. He's not the normal Kenyan story. His father used to run a little bit, but he's taken to marathon running as though he was born to it. So third and fourth across the line. And the big gap now. So Mekinen in the pale shirt ahead of Emmanuel, uh, sorry, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Mutai. Mutai. Jeffrey Mutai. Just not being able to bring the sort of form that many thought he had here. Thought he was in 2 5, 2 4 shape. But he looks very tired, doesn't he? So Mekinen. You set a world junior best I mentioned earlier of 2.432 in Dubai at the beginning of the year. Is 18 years of age on his passport and the Ethiopian will add to his two teammates ahead of him. There's Mo Farah in the distance. Mo Farah stretching hard, trying to catch Emmanuel Mutai as Jeffrey Mutai starts to really fade. Mekinen crossing the line now, but Mo Farah being cheered by the crowd and uh, on their feet here in the home straight, giving their hero a big welcome. Here he is, he looks so, so tired. That British record is gone. Is it going to be an English record? It will be. Two hours, eight and 20 for Mo Farah. A tough debut and one which, who knows what decisions will be made from it, but if he didn't know that the marathon was a hard event before he came here today, he certainly does now. For anybody else, that's a, not a bad debut. You'd be absolutely delighted to run that. I honestly think Mo will be a little bit disappointed to run 2.8. I don't think he would have even set out, Brendan, to run 2.8 in terms of if he'd said that's what your performance will be. But the point about the marathon is you just do not know until you do it. You have to do one to find out. Now he knows. Well, he's done one and he's found out that it's very, very hard in the middle of the race and in the later stages. He's found out how good it is to taste victory in London on the track. And the last three races on the road, you know, he's lost them all. Two half marathons and then this one. And in the last couple of years, he's only lost one middle distance track race. That was a 5,000 meters last year. He didn't lose a single one in 2012. So if he needs any advice, and he doesn't really, but if he wants it, Mo, stick to the track. I think that's your future. The roads, eventually, he may well run well, but for the moment, it's, it's 1,500 metres, 5,000 metres and 10,000 metres. This was a great occasion for him to come here and enjoy, and we enjoyed it. And now Mo Farah will tell us all, and he's not going to make any quick decisions, but he may give us some hints. Well, Mo Farah alongside me. Mo, it was always going to be a baptism of fire. How tough was it? It was pretty tough. Um, yeah, no experience of this, but, um, yeah, quite disappointed today, but, you know, you try things and if it don't work, you know, at least you give it a go. You had a few problems with the drink station. Did, did that have any factor in it? I missed one and then, not really, it was just, you know, the pace, you know, I should have, I think, I went with the front group because it was kind of, wasn't too far, but at the same time, I think it would have been nice to just sit in the group. Because there was a long period in the race where you were really almost in no man's land, weren't you, with nobody to pace you? Yeah, no one, and then the pace makers were slightly a bit ahead. And, but, you know, you learn. Life goes on. <laughs> and in terms of, you know, you've got to consider this, where, do you think you would do, want to do another marathon again the way you feel now? Yeah, definitely, without disappointing. Yeah, 100%. I've never, I've, I'm, no, I'm not going to finish it. Because it's interesting, Brendan was saying in the commentary, maybe you should think about 2016 Rio defending your title at 10,000 metres. Yeah, it's de definitely still give it a go, but at the same time, you know, you, I'm, I'm, never I'm not going to finish it like this. Um, I will be back, and I think it's a matter of some experience and, you know, learning. But it would, it would have been disappointing to do somewhere else, my first marathon. This was the city I grew up, the crowd, absolutely amazing. I just wish I gave a little bit more to the crowd and the support. Well, look, from the response you got from the crowd all the way around the course and also from here on the finish, I don't think anybody's disappointed with what you did. I, I gave it a go, but, you know, that's all, I, that's all I could do. But, you know, I'm just disappointed I didn't get, you know, go out there and 
give a bit more than you know what the crowd deserve and, and the people support me all the way. But you know the field was tough. You, you've got Stephen, Olympic champion, just finishing now, and it was strong. It's the strongest field ever by put together by the London Marathon. So, you know, I've gone straight into the deep end, but at the same time, that's what athletics is about. With the benefit of hindsight, should you have picked a race like Ken and Nisa did last week and have it paced for you where you wanted it to be? It would have been nice, but at the same time, you know, London, this is my city. Um, it would be wrong to do any other marathon. I had to do it here. Look, Mo, thanks for speaking to us so soon after you finish, and we'll speak to you a little bit more later. No problem. Thank you. Well, I'm not surprised that he's disappointed because he sets high standards. You know, Mo is a, is a champion, and he came here with aspirations to run well. I, he didn't need to win, but I think he certainly would have hoped to contend with the marathon perhaps a little better than he did. As Paula said, he's had a few problems. He said himself in the press conference the other day, I've had a few hiccups. Well, let's give you the official results of this 2014 Virgin Money London Marathon. Wilson Kipsang there in a new course record, 2.04.29. Stanley B. Watt stayed with him for a little while, and the Cabeda last year's champion in third place.